All right, so today we're going over the Doppler effect, okay? Doppler effect is something that we experience all the time, okay? It, however, seems to violate one of the rules that we have gone over a bunch of times in this unit, and that is that the frequency of a wave cannot change. However, our perception of it can, okay? The frequency of a wave can never change, but our perception of it can due to either the motion of the observer, the source, or both. Okay, so if you've ever noticed when an ambulance or a fire truck goes by you, it sounds different on the way towards you than it does on the way away from you. Anyone ever notice that? Okay, that is because of the Doppler effect. Okay, and the Doppler effect is simply an alteration of the distance between the waves because things are moving. Right, so that's what we'll look at. Um, first, I'll have Sheldon Cooper explain it though. All right, so what we're going to go over is what the Doppler effect is, okay? Very simply, it's a perceived change in frequency of waves because either the observer or the source are moving, or both, okay? I mean, the, the effect is amplified even more if the two things are moving towards each other or away from each other, okay? If only one of them is moving, then the effect isn't as great, okay? Understand how the Doppler effect changes the pitch of a sound. We're going to look at what the waves do because the object is moving, okay? And we're going to understand that the Doppler effect is responsible for the sound barrier, right? How many people have heard of that term before? Okay, so the sound barrier was a big issue back at the beginning of the space race. Okay, so back in the 40s, jet engines were kind of new, okay? But people realized that jet engines were going to be vastly superior to prop engines, okay? So propellers, I mean, you can only go, you can only go so fast with a propeller, right? A propeller can only change the speed of air by so much. But a jet engine, okay, I mean, it can suck in the air and blow it out so fast, so much faster. So it could propel planes to incredibly high rates of speed. The problem was that the planes couldn't take it, okay? Um, there were a lot of test pilots who died during the late 40s because they were going to be the man who broke the sound barrier. They just got broken most of the time, okay? Because the idea was we just weren't building planes powerful enough because they would just fly faster and faster and faster. As they approached the speed of sound, they would shake and then they would just blow up, okay? The turbulence would get so bad that they would just fall apart and it would look from the ground like they ran into a wall in the sky. Hence the sound barrier, okay? Because from the ground, that's what it looked like, okay? It looked like this plane just slammed into something in the sky, okay? Um, and they knew that this, the planes were going around the speed of sound when that would happen. So they had to come up with a way to get these planes to break through this barrier, okay? Now, really, what the barrier is, is the plane's own sound, okay? Remember that sound waves are a series of compressions and rarefactions, Okay, so essentially, you compress air when you make sound. Well, what's happening for planes that are going around the speed of sound is all the compressions they produce are going, well, not slower, but the same speed that they are. So they can't get away, all right? They can't run away from the plane because the plane is going just as fast as the sound is. So you, what you get is this layer of compressed air that starts to build up in front of the plane because these sound waves can't get away. They're going the same speed the plane is, okay? And so this dense air builds up in front of the plane and it's harder for the plane to get through it because it's essentially thicker air, okay? And that created this barrier that planes couldn't puncture or couldn't punch through, okay, and get to go faster than that. So they had to make some design changes to the planes that would allow them to essentially get through and survive this short period of uh, you know, flying through this really dense air. Because once you get past that, then all the sound you produce, yeah, it falls away, okay? Because it can't go as fast as you're going, right? So it falls away behind you and you know, suddenly you just jump to this in, you know, much higher rate of speed. And that's actually what happened the first time the sound barrier was broken. Okay, a guy named Chuck Yeager okay, was flying this, uh, well, it was an orange cigar-shaped rocket with wings, okay? Because at that time, the mentality was, we just have to build a more powerful plane. So they went away from jet engines and they just put a rocket engine in them, okay? They would, they would actually, these planes were not capable of taking off 
under their own power. They were attached to the bottom of a bomber, flown up to high altitude and dropped. And then they would light that candle and off that thing would go. Okay, the rocket engine would ignite and the pilot would try and fly this rocket powered suicide machine. Okay, um, to try and break the sound barrier. Um, and then eventually, obviously, they did break the sound barrier. And then they realized, oh, we didn't need a rocket. We just had to be smart. Okay, uh, so it wasn't about, you know, more power, more power. It was just about okay, designing the plane in such a way that it could survive the turbulence that was created uh, near the speed of sound. That, we'll get to that. It's actually, uh, it's a quick release of the pressure and then a buildup of the waves behind. Just the way that they fall behind causes interference constructive in nature. Okay? And when you've got all that sound in front that's all built up, you get a lot of pressure. And then when you finally release that pressure, okay, then there's a boom. Um, and you, there's actually a visible effect as well. You can see when a plane breaks the sound barrier, this cloud forms around the plane for an instant. Yeah, like these. Yeah, just like these here. Okay, so a cloud forms there because it's um, like Charles Law, Boyle's Law, like gas law. Okay, so you put the water vapor under this intense pressure, okay, and you can actually force it back into a liquid state for an instant. And then suddenly that pressure is released and it's gone. Okay, so the cloud forms and then disappears well, as the pressure releases. Right, so you actually can see that happen here. All right. Um, so this is this would be what the sound waves would look like as a plane is flying along. OK, they're going to be a little bit closer in front and a little bit further apart in the back. All right. Because it's moving. So the sound it produces tries to get away from it, but it produces another crest before that one gets as far away as it would get if the plane was standing still. Everyone kind of follow me there. If the plane was standing still, all the waves would be equal. It would look like, you know, when you throw a rock in the water. Um, but when you approach the speed of sound, you get all those waves building up in front. Okay? The waves behind fall behind, okay? and, and they're, they're wider. Right? So you'd hear an incredibly high-pitched hiss in front of the plane, but you'd hear a rumble like thunder behind the plane okay? because the Doppler effect would be so amplified by the fact that this thing is going so fast. It had to do with aerodynamic. It also had to do with lift properties and control. The pilots would, were actually like kind of losing control of the plane because the control surfaces weren't built to withstand the, the turbulence, essentially. Okay. Well, what, there, there, I found a video this morning that explains it much better than I'm doing right now. So a jet engine uses the second law of thermodynamics. Energy flows from hot to cold. Okay, so at the front of a jet engine, it, we're burning JP5 jet fuel. It's, it's like kerosene, it's what you'd use in a camp stove. Okay, uh, and so it burns really, really hot. So it creates this area of intense heat, and then the air behind is very cold. So the air naturally flows from this high heat through the turbines to the cold. And when the turbines turn, they amplify that. Okay, and so they're, cre they're creating this incredible thrust. Yeah. And if you have a like a fighter jet engine, they actually have a series of two of those. They have the main jet engine and then they have the afterburner, right? Which which produces even more of that. Yeah. All right, so we'll just uh, watch this video that I found this morning, which is better than the ones I had here. Okay. Um, that kind of exp when they first broke the sound barrier and realized, wow, there's this massive release of pressure, and then there's this wave that travels behind the plane. The immediate next thought was, can that break stuff? Can we use it to blow stuff up? Can it be a weapon? Okay, like that, because I mean, these are the people that built the plane. They were the military, right? Anything could be a weapon if we think about it long enough. And so they were. They did a lot of studies into, all right, how can we use sonic booms as a weapon, right? And they were even saying in that video that you know, sonic, you know, supersonic flight over land, at least at low altitudes, is prohibited, okay, because it can be damaging to people's eardrums and, and things like that. But in terms of damage to property, it's not really. Okay, uh, Mythbusters actually did an episode where they had an F-18 fly at various altitudes and break the sound barrier over top of this little like house that they had built to test it, and they couldn't even get it to break the windows. Okay, it could rattle the dishes, but it couldn't knock them off the shelf. Okay, it takes too long. Um, so it, it's just like it basically yes, there's a boom. It's loud. It can hurt your eardrums if you're close to it, but it's not something that's you know going to be a really effective weapon at damaging things. Now, of course, they had limits to how low they they were allowed to legally fly, so they couldn't fly right over top of it, but they got as close as they could. What the military discovered was that yeah, if we fly this supersonic plane really close to the ground, it does create 
some effect. Like if you fly it right over the water, it creates this big fan tail, okay, out of the water. It looks really cool as planes flying along and there's water spraying up behind it, okay. Um, if you do that over land, it can literally pick up objects. If you're really close to ground level, it can pick them up and throw them, right. And so their thought was, all right, well, we'll, we'll uh, if you run out of ammunition, just fly really low, break the sound barrier over top of all the soldiers, and you'll throw them out of the way, okay. And they'll deafen all of them and be like, that's, that's great. Except pilots went, yeah, but if I can go that fast, why wouldn't I just fly away? Okay, because if I fly really low over soldiers who are ready for me, I'll get shot down by small arms fire. Okay, it's not really practical okay, to fly a you know multi-million dollar aircraft over you know some guy who's got an AK-47 and is going to spend two cents on a bullet and take you out. Okay, um, it's <laughs> it's not a really practical way to do things. Right. And then you still would pass two, so it would be a bigger amount. Not really, no. It's just a bigger delay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that I mean that is the thing, but I mean if you've already, you know, been detected, they know you're coming. They can see you. You're not invisible, right? <laughs> you're not going faster than light and as a result invisible. But um yeah, you'd be yeah, you'd be silent until afterwards. Yeah. Uh, they'll feel the rumble. They can sometimes hear the rumble as well. Um, but other than that, not much. It's mostly like and even inside the cockpit, they can still speak. The sound travels within the cockpit just fine because the air inside the cockpit is moving with them. Right. Um, so it doesn't really create an effect like that inside the cockpit. I mean, there's been passenger aircraft that could break the sound barrier, right? the Concorde which was a death trap. Okay? That's why they don't fly it anymore. Um, but it had this special shaped nose because uh, in order to break the sound barrier, you have to have a certain shape to the plane. And the um, problem with having a really big plane that's supersonic is it really creates problems with the lift characteristics at low speed. Uh, and that made it hard to land and hard to control. So they put this variable nose on the Concorde. So when it was flying supersonic, the nose would be straight. When it was flying at lower speeds, the nose would would articulate and face downwards and it would create this additional lift that the pilots could use like flaps on a plane okay in order to control it when they landed it but it was it was a hard plane to fly it gave them more control in a high high turbulence um, situation okay if you just have the control surfaces on the wings um, you only get that you can get a, a lift that, or a lift or a downward force that's abrupt. Having the vertical, the horizontal stabilizers on the back meant that the wings could be a little smaller and you would still have this additional control through turbulent air. It would keep the plane from just suddenly diving or climbing. Okay, and that, that was the problem they were having was, okay, I can't, I need to go a little bit faster. So I'm going to in, initiate a dive and then the dive would just, it would get out of control. Having that horizontal stabilizer on the back would allow them to control that better in a high turbulence environment. Okay. And which is why now basically all planes have that, right? Like the earliest planes were just wings, right? They didn't really have those control surfaces at the back. Okay, um, so that's Doppler effect. Okay, we've kind of seen that. Um, so these are the diagrams that we kind of saw in the video as well. If the train is stationary, waves in front and waves behind all have the same wavelength and thus the same frequency. Okay, but as you increase in speed, okay, um, obviously the waves in front pile up. Okay, so a person in front here's a higher frequency and a shorter wavelength than the person in the back who here's a longer uh, wavelength and bigger frequency or uh, lower frequency. The source is still putting out sound at the same frequency, but because the source is moving it makes us perceive the frequency to be different, okay? If this plane, train were to suddenly stop, all the waves would be identical. The source is still making the same sound, right? When the, when the uh, you know, car went by with the horn on, okay? The horn's frequency was constant, but we heard it differently because of what was happening to the waves. The waves were still being produced at the same frequency, okay? okay? Same thing can happen with light if you could go fast enough to see it. Okay, we have, you have to go pretty fast to create a Doppler effect with light, but we do have instruments that can detect it. And this is one of the reasons why now we believe that the universe is expanding. We can see that objects in general are moving away from each other because their wavelengths are shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. 
Okay, they're shifted red because they're moving away. If they were shifted blue, that would mean they're moving towards us. Right. This is also one of the ways that they've um, used to detect um, extrasolar planets, so planets around other stars. Okay, they look at the movement of the star itself. First thing they look at is brightness change. So if a planet moves between its its star and us, the star dims. Okay, uh, but what they also look at is the wavelength of light emitted by the star. Right? It's not something we can see visually, but we can use an X-ray telescope to detect even small changes in the frequency of the light coming to us due to the fact that this, the star is moving towards or away from us. And they can do a lot of calculations using those changes in wavelength that help them to determine how much the star is moving and how big the planet that's causing that movement must be, how far that planet could be from the sun based on that. They can do a lot of extrapolating okay, from just that Doppler data that we get. And it's just a simple Doppler effect okay, kind of thing that's based on frequencies are perceived to change because or observed to change, even though they're not really changing. All right. Um, so like we said, bunching up okay, in front okay, is because the, the, the object or the source isn't getting away quickly uh, or is, is not allowing the, the waves to get away quickly and then obviously is running away from them behind. Okay, so we hear those different frequencies. All right. And basically the same thing. All right. So we're going to look at uh, just a couple of things here. Main thing is the formula for the Doppler effect. I'm going to borrow your formula sheet here because I always write the things down there. Okay, so the formula for the Doppler effect is like this. It's always the FO I mess up. Okay, so F equals FO, and then we have V plus or minus VO over V plus or minus VS. Now, I know if you're looking at your formula sheet right now, you're going to go, no, no, Coder, it doesn't look like that. I'll explain why in a minute. Okay, this is the true Doppler effect formula. Okay, what the Doppler effect formula allows us to do in this setup is to calculate the Doppler frequency okay that's the one we hear okay using the original frequency original or actual okay and then we've got these speeds here, okay? V, without anything next to it, these, so these two Vs here are the speed of the waves. These Vs with the subscripts are the speed of the observer, and the speed of the source. Okay. Now, I know when you look at that formula, you're like, holy crap, like it's plus or minus. How do I know which one? Okay. Well, you know which one based on whether the object is moving towards you or moving away from you. Okay. Now, for some reason, a couple of years ago, Alberta Learning decided that you didn't have to do Doppler problems involving moving observers, just moving sources. I don't know why. It doesn't really make them any more difficult or any more easy to remove that. But they've decided you only have to do problems with a moving source. So your formula looks like this. V divided by, so the speed of the waves, divided by speed of the waves plus or minus the speed of the source. Okay, so let's figure out when I need to add and when I need to subtract. If the object is moving towards me, F is greater or smaller than the original? It's greater. I hear a higher frequency of sound if it's moving towards me. Everyone okay with that? Okay, so that's based on what the original frequency is times whatever's in this bracket. So if whatever's in this, if, if I'm going to have F be bigger than FO, whatever's in this bracket has to be greater than what? One. Okay, I have to multiply by a number greater than one if FO times that number is going to be bigger. All right, so what's going to give me a bigger, a number bigger than one? Adding or subtracting down here? Subtracting, right, because then I'll have the big number on the top and the small number on the bottom. 
Okay, so we use subtraction for an approaching source. We add for a retreating source. The opposite would have been true if we had the observer part on there. Okay, you would add for an approaching observer and subtract for an approaching or sorry, for a retreating observer. Okay. Everybody all right with that? Okay. Is manipulating this formula gonna be a little challenging? A little bit. Here's some more good news for you. You'll never have to solve for the speed of the waves because it's in two places. Okay. And because, I mean, you guys will know, you guys would know how to do this because you're taking physics second semester and you've probably taken math 20 already. Okay. But in order to do that, you would have to do the F word factor. Yeah. Okay. We, since we can't guarantee that you've taken math 20 by the time you take this, you don't have to do it. Okay. Or passed it. Yeah. Like me. Okay. So you're only going to ever have to solve for the Doppler frequency, the original frequency, or the speed of the source, okay? Those will be the only things you'll have to solve for. You won't have to solve for the speed of the waves because it would involve you having to factor the equation, okay? Because it's in two places. All right, um, so let's have a look at those manipulations of the formula then. So I've got F equals FO, okay? And then I've got V over V, and we'll say it's for an approaching source, minus VS. All right, I wanna solve for FO. How do I get FO by itself? Yeah, I divide the whole thing in brackets over here. Think order of operations. Would I do this before I multiplied it by FO? Yes, right? You do parentheses first, okay? So I would do the parentheses first. This is really then just a number. So I can divide that number over to the other side, right? So um, FO would equal F divided by V over V minus VS, okay? I would just bring the whole bracket over. Okay. Don't have to take it apart. All right. Um, what if I want to solve for VS? What should I move now? Yeah, I should move FO first. Okay, so I'm going to divide both sides by FO. So I'll have F over FO equals, now I don't need brackets, V over V minus VS. Okay. VS is on the bottom. Do I want it there? No, I need it on the top. But rather than move it to the other side, my rules of algebra tell me I can do whatever I want to an equation as long as I do it to both sides. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip both sides. Okay, I'm just going to go FO over F equals V minus VS over V. Now VS is on the top. Okay, as long as I do it to both sides, I can do whatever I want. Okay, so I need to move V over here. So I'm going to multiply by V. And then I'm going to get VS by itself. Now here's a problem. If I move V, VS will be negative. negative. I don't like that. So I actually add VS over to the other side. And then I subtract this. Okay. So what I end up with to get positive VS okay, is I have V minus FOV over F. Okay. You could, but I always forget. That's why I don't do it that way. If you've got a good enough memory, then by all means, solve for negative VS and remember it's negative. Okay. The big thing is, guys, is that, I mean, if you forget, you're just going to get a negative number and you have to understand it shouldn't be. Okay. Um, if instead of subtracting here, if this was a retreating object, then it wouldn't be a big deal. I would just yeah, well, I just subtract V over, right? And no, it'd be fine. It'd be solving for positive VS. Okay. So now is it quite as intimidating as it looked like before? It's a little bit, but it's not too bad. Okay. I mean, it's a bit involved, but it's nothing you guys haven't done. Right. Okay. That's what you'll have to do with Doppler effect. You'll have to solve a Doppler effect problem that would have, you know, a moving source, okay, either retreating or approaching. That's the big thing you have to remember is, is it approaching or is it retreating? All right. So we'll look at a couple of examples here. So I got a train traveling at 30 meters per second. What did they give me there? 
speed of the source, right. Okay, its, whist its whistle generates a sound wave with a frequency of 224 hertz. F or F-O? F-O. Okay, you are standing beside the tracks, not on them. Important, okay. All right, standing beside the tracks as the train passes you with its whistle blowing. So that means the train is approaching you. Okay. Uh, what change in frequency do you detect for the pitch of the whistle? So they're wanting us to solve for the Doppler shifted frequency. Okay, um, If the speed of sound in air, so the speed of the waves, is 330 meters per second. All right, so we have everything except the Doppler shifted frequency, which means I don't have to manipulate. I just have to plug numbers in. Am I adding or subtracting? Subtracting, it's an approaching source. Okay, so I plug in my numbers here, 224 hertz times 330 over 330 minus 30. All right, so 224 times bracket brackets, uh, 330. Yeah, that's not annoying at all. Oh, I was recording that too. <laughs> Idiot. It's distracting. I can't even punch in the right numbers. Okay, so the Doppler shifted frequency that I'm going to hear as the train approaches is 246.4 hertz. Okay, um, does that fit with what we know? Yes, it's higher than what the train actually was producing, and that's what I should hear, a higher frequency of sound. All right, so we would have 246 hertz as our Doppler shifted sound. Okay. Questions on that one? Yes, exactly. So it's just like the car horn video that we watched. Right? Okay, try those two. First one's kind of what we did already, okay? Um, and then, yeah, it's just like the one we just did. And number two is asking you to calculate the actual frequency of the sound. So for question number two, we have an airplane that's approaching at 360 kilometers per hour. What do I have to convert that to? Meters per, meters second. per second. All right, that's 100 meters per second because you divide by 3.6, it's an easy one. Okay, um, so that's the speed of the source. Okay, this, uh, if you measure the pitch of its approaching engines to be 512 hertz, that's F, okay? I measure that, it's the one I hear. Okay, um, and the speed of sound in air there is 345 meters per second. I need to calculate FO. All right, so I've got F equals, Calvin, be quiet, V over, is it approaching or retreating? It's approaching, okay, so it's minus Vs. All I do is bring the brackets over to the other side to solve for FO. So FO will be F divided by V over V minus Vs. Okay, so that'll be uh, 512 divided by 345 over 345 minus 300. Or sorry, 100, not 300. That is 100. Okay, so when we plug all that in, we should get 364 hertz as the original frequency or actual frequency of the plane. Okay, questions on that one? All right. Try number four. You don't have to do three because it asks you to solve for the speed of the waves, which you don't have to do. So try number four. You are looking for the train's speed in number four. Okay, so on number four, we've got the train moving away from us. Okay, frequency of its whistle is determined to be 475 hertz. That is the Doppler frequency. 
Okay, the actual frequency of the whistle is 500 hertz. If I was ever not sure, will the context of the question usually tell me? Yes, I mean, it says it's going away. I should know that the higher one is the actual one, okay, in that situation, All right? 500 hertz. Okay, and the speed of sound is 350 meters per second, okay? So I'm looking for the train's speed. So I have F equals FO, V over V plus VS this time, okay? Because I have a retreating source on this one. All right, so I'm gonna bring FO over to the other side. Okay, that's gonna remove my need for brackets. Then I'm gonna flip both sides so that I get VS on the top. So I'll have FO over F equals V plus VS over V. I'm gonna multiply both sides by V and then I'm gonna subtract V over to the other side. So I will have FOV over F minus V equals VS. Okay, when I plug in my numbers, that'll be 500 times 350 divided by 475 okay, minus 350. Okay, so really all this is doing is getting us a ratio okay, between, the two, between the two frequencies and then allowing us to subtract it from there. Okay, um, so we'll have 500 times 350 okay, divided by 475 okay, minus 350. So train's moving at 18.4 meters per second, okay, according to that. Okay, expect you're gonna get a Doppler effect problem on your unit exam, okay, one for sure. Okay. All right, any other questions on those? Everyone's good with those? Okay, try this one. 